Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm Lynn Weil, Director of External Affairs for CSET, the Center for Security and Emerging Technology at Georgetown University. We're very pleased to welcome you to our first webinar of the year. And uh, it's a consequential one with respect to the changes coming to the US government next week. Our panelists today will discuss their recommendations for the Biden administration on policy at the intersection of national security and emerging technology. Some of the items they'll discuss today are posted on CSET's website. In the coming days, we'll send around some relevant links to those who registered for today's webinar. In a moment, you'll hear from our moderator who in turn will introduce the panelists. But first, a brief bit of housekeeping. All attendees' microphones are muted. And if you're joining us by computer, we cannot see you. If you're on a computer and experience any technical issues, use the chat function at the bottom of the screen to alert us. And a CSET member of the team here at External Affairs will try to help you out. Don't use the chat on any other occasion for any other purpose just yet. We'll come back to it during the Q&A. And now it's my pleasure to hand the reins over to our moderator, Helen Toner. Helen is CSET's Director of Strategy. She previously worked as a Senior Research Analyst at the Open Philanthropy Project, where she advised policymakers and grant makers on artificial intelligence policy and strategy. Between then and joining CSET, Helen lived in Beijing, studying the Chinese AI ecosystem as a research affiliate at Oxford University's Center for the Governance of AI. Helen has written for Foreign Affairs and other outlets on the national security implications of AI and machine learning for China and the United States, as well as testifying before the US-China Economic and Security Review Commission. Helen, over to you. Thank you, Lynn, and good afternoon to everyone joining us. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm very much looking forward to talking with the three wonderful colleagues who will be joining me today. As Lynn mentioned, the context for today's event is, of course, the rapidly approaching inauguration of President-elect Biden next week. Back in September, CSET published a set of five one-pagers with recommendations on technology and national security for the incoming administration. So today we have three of the authors of those one-pagers joining us to discuss their recommendations from September, what's changed since then, and much, much more. Let's dive right in. I'll start by welcoming Remco Zwetslut, our first panelist. Remco is a research fellow at CSET focused on global talent flows in AI and their policy implications. He's written on AI for the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Foreign Affairs, Lawfare, and other publications. Remco is also a research affiliate and doctoral scholar at the University of Oxford's Center for the Governance of AI. He has previously worked at OpenAI and holds graduate degrees from Yale University and the University of Oxford. So the format I'd like to go with today is as follows. To start out, I'll ask each of the panelists, so starting with you, Remco, to just take two minutes to tell us about the recommendation that you wrote in September. And then once everyone has, has introduced their topic, we'll switch over to audience Q&A and discussion among the panelists. So Remco, over to you for what you recommended, why it matters. And of course, between the time that you wrote it and now, uh, we're no longer working with a generic next administration. So if you wanna adjust you know, anything that you wrote back in September to account for the fact um, that we'll have a Biden administration and what we know so far about the Biden administration, you know, feel free to, to adjust as you please. Over to you. Absolutely, thanks, Alan. Um, yeah, actually just this week, uh, I was reading a piece uh, in the China Daily about uh, what China could do to do better in AI. And it quoted uh, Ren Zhangfei, uh, the founder of Huawei about, uh, you know, his thoughts on that question. And he said that the really, you know, the biggest advantage that the US has uh, is people. Uh, quote, you know, what can we learn from the US? Attract talent, end quote. Uh, so I think, you know, our work on immigration was relevant uh, before and it's still relevant today. Um, you don't usually score points in DC by, by quoting Huawei executives approvingly, I guess, but uh, I think that was really, really right on the money, um, especially in AI where, uh, you know, our research has shown about two thirds of graduate students in AI at US universities are international students as is about half of the total US AI workforce uh, with graduate degrees, as far as we can tell. Um, the National Security Commission on AI has said that talent is, quote, the most important driver of progress in all facets of AI. Uh, so 
international talent is really hugely important and to continue attracting and retaining it, the US will have to reform its immigration system. Uh, we've done a lot of analysis of what that might look like, but for the one pager you mentioned, we focused on OPT, um, which is a specific program and it stands for optional practical training. And what it does is it allows international students uh, from, uh, you know, international graduates from STEM uh, degrees uh, at US universities to stay in the country for up to three years and work at a US employer right after graduation. And what it is is really an essential bridge uh, for people into other sort of longer term immigration programs such as sort of better known programs like H1Bs uh, or even green cards. And uh, OPT is, is much less well known than these other programs, but it's arguably more important to US AI competitiveness, especially because it's also less secure. Uh, in 2017, there were 270,000 people who entered uh, OPT compared to 125,000 for, for H1Bs. And when we surveyed uh, US AI PhD graduates last year, uh, we found that 85% of them had used OPT to stay in the United States, which was much higher than for any other uh, immigration program. Uh, what happened during the Trump administration is that twice OPT was put on the regulatory agenda um, for reform, which really was a sign that they were, I think, going to cancel it. And the reason they would have been able to do that was that OPT was created through regulation and not legislation in contrast to a lot of other immigration programs. Uh, that's also the reason that it's being challenged in court. Uh, so there's been a lawsuit that alleges that OPT is illegal. Now, luckily, it was not canceled, and the lawsuit looks like uh, it's it's been unsuccessful. Um, but uh, we highlighted OPT because of its sort of importance uh, and neglectedness in some sense. Um, the Biden administration hopefully won't cancel OPT. So <laughs> in that sense, that recommendation hopefully won't be necessary anymore. Uh, but the one thing I think that would be hugely important uh, in the next couple of years is if Congress uh, would enshrine OPT into legislation so that if a future administration is as skeptical of immigration as the Trump administration was, they won't have the ability to just throw it out if they want to. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much for that uh, summary of both, you know, talent as a key issue to AI and also the, the tactical importance of OPT. That's fantastic. Um, we'll leave Remco for now. And next up, I'll welcome Dr. Melissa Flagg. Melissa is a senior fellow at CSEP, as well as a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Geotech Center. She previously served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research, where she was responsible for policy and oversight of Defense Department science and technology programs. Melissa's career has also included work at the State Department, the Office of Naval Research, the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, the MacArthur Foundation, and the Army Research Laboratory, as well as running her own consulting business and serving as CTO of a small consumer startup. She holds a PhD in pharmaceutical chemistry. Melissa, your one pager from September proposed a new way of approaching research security for the United States. And then actually yesterday, you and your co-author Zach Arnold published a full length paper expanding on your idea and your recommendations. So I'd love you to tell us all about that. Thanks so much, Helen. Uh, it's fun to be here. It's a great and exciting moment. Um, Sometimes excitement is stressful, but um, it's worth being in the middle of the fray nonetheless. You'll get good stories out of it. Um, and I'm thrilled to be talking about research security. This is something I've been thinking about for 20 years. Um, as we look at the world, the landscape of technology has fundamentally changed. Um, the United States used to be the majority of global tech, and we were very focused on attracting external talent, and we were very much in command of the global system. Today, we find ourselves as a quarter of global R&D, and we find federally funded R&D as a quarter of that American uh, slice of the pie. And so as we think about research security, we become more challenged in how to use our traditional approaches to openness. Uh, and this, I think, ties very tightly to what Rimco was talking about, really drawing on these traditional strengths of openness but also being aware that we are challenged by uh, different norms that are being put forward out there in the world. So it's, it's exciting to think about the fact that since the vast majority of American research and development is not actually being funded nor performed by the federal government, that we need to open up our frame about the role of the government in securing it. And we need to really invite in an all of nation approach to getting engaged in securing that capability. And we really have to think beyond these punitive law enforcement approaches where they don't really have the full information, the full authority or the trust of a community that is not required to respond to federal demands. 
And so Zach and I spent a lot of time thinking about what a public private institution would look like that would really give the researchers and their organizations that cut across industry, nonprofits, academia, um, the tools that they need and the data they need and the risk assessment frameworks that they need to be a part of securing our national R&D as opposed to thinking about this as something that is solely top down and solely focused on federally funded research. Fantastic, thank you. I'm really looking forward to discussing more in the Q&A, but for now, I will welcome our third and final panelist, Andrew Imbri. Andrew is a senior fellow at, senior fellow at CSET, where he focuses on issues at the intersection of AI, tech diplomacy, and international security. Before joining us, he was a fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and a senior advisor to visiting distinguished statesman John Kerry. Before Carnegie from 2013 to 2017, Andrew served as a member of the policy planning staff and speechwriter to Secretary Kerry at the US Department of State. And he's also worked as a professional staff member on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Andrew holds a PhD in international relations from Georgetown. And his first book, Power on the Precipice was published last September by Yale University Press. I'm also very much looking forward to his second book, which is in the works with CSET's Cyber AI Director Ben Buchanan and is under contract with MIT Press. Andrew, it's great to have you. Can you tell us about what you'd recommend to the Biden administration as they look to work with our allies and partners on AI and on technology more broadly? Well, great, terrific. Uh, thank you so much, Helen. Uh, and it's a real treat to be here with Melissa and Remco. Uh, so in my memo with my colleague, Ryan Fedashik, we tried to put forward a US approach to international technology alliances and specifically how the United States could work effectively with its broad network of allies and partners along 10 key strategic initiatives from targeted export controls and investment screening to affirmative approaches on data sharing frameworks, interoperability, investments in privacy enhancing technologies, cooperative R&D programs, human capital development uh, standards, and much more. So I'd be delighted to talk about those initiatives in the Q&A, but what I wanted to do is just share a little bit of the context of so the strategic context for why this matters. And I think I'd just start with something that I think all of our viewers tuning in knows, which is that AI is a general purpose technology with a wide range of applications. And it's crucial to our innovation base, to our shared prosperity, to our military power. But in the end, technologies are means, not ends. And so the strategic question is, how do we shape the use of this technology wisely to meet important long-term national goals? And for me, I think the answer has to be rooted in our values and in an effort to try to promote and protect the American way of life, to show that inclusive, multi-ethnic, multi-confessional democracy, despite all the challenges that we are facing at home and in the world, can really deliver for people. And I think the incoming Biden administration is very well placed to deliver on this agenda. The president-elect has made alliances, democracy, and multilateralism a central part of his foreign policy approach. And I think the incoming senior team really appreciates that any sustainable international technology strategy has to be linked to a domestic technology strategy that strengthens our middle class and models the kind of values that we want to realize in the world. So what kind of international component are we talking about for a technology strategy? And I think we have to start with the fact that the world, as Melissa talked about, is, is much more fluid, more contested, more competitive. Russia and China pose different challenges, but they are both taking aim at the liberal order, uh, undermining the integrity of democracies. Uh, and I think in many ways, trying to leverage emerging technologies and AI to gain strategic advantage. So democracies really have to work together. They can't afford piecemeal ad hoc responses. They need to protect the integrity of their research ecosystems, but they also need an affirmative agenda in the world. And I think that's gonna be really important. Uh, and so what does that look like? Well, I think our strategic muscle memory inclines us towards sort of singular comprehensive alliances uh, toward a singular threat. But I think in today's world, we're gonna need to forge agile, flexible, and geographically dispersed coalitions across a whole host of technologies and international regimes. Uh, the British have proposed a D10. Uh, there's been discussion of a T12 of a sort of a leading group of advanced democracies which I think would be useful for coordinating policy and investment, for managing the inevitable differences between allies, 
and for thinking strategically then about how to narrow down into these discrete coalitions depending on the issue area and our objectives uh, and for reaching out to a whole new array of actors that are critical in this space. So I think this is a big agenda, it's a big challenge, but I think it's a huge opportunity for the country and it's a chance to really try to put forward a bipartisan agenda at home uh, to make this happen. So I look forward to the Q&A, thanks. Thanks so much, Andrew. Yeah, I love the phrase uh, agile alliances. I feel like it's not just a catchy alliterative title, but is of course um, really describing a core concept for, as you say, actually shaping the, the different alliances with different allies and partners to our, to our specific needs. Um, great, I'd love to welcome back all of our panelists and hand it over to Lynn to set us up for Q&A. Thank you, Helen, and thanks everyone. There are bound to be a lot of questions and comments about your remarks. Um, so folks, if you do have uh, something to ask of the panel, now's your opportunity, please put it in the chat. Um, meantime, uh, Helen gets to exercise the moderator's prerogative and ask the first question. A reminder, we may not get to all the questions that folks ask, and we're sorry about that. Uh, we'll do our best to cover as much ground as possible. And if you're phoning in for this meeting, you won't be able to ask a question. We thank you for understanding the limitations there. Helen, over to you. Great. Okay. So it's obviously lots of fun to make recommendations of all kinds and say, do this, do that, do the other thing. But uh, there are lots of um, political, bureaucratic, other realities to handle. So I wanted to ask each of you, maybe going in reverse order, so starting with Andrew, um, what you see as the biggest obstacles to your recommendations, whether they're, yeah, political obstacles, bureaucratic obstacles, implementation, what you, what you think the, the biggest potential issues would be, and of course, how you would suggest overcoming them. I think this is crucial. I, I mean, I see a couple of major challenges for implementing this agenda, diplomatic challenges, domestic challenges, uh, bureaucratic challenges. And so let me just walk through those briefly. On the diplomatic side, you know, I think there's a challenge of trying to align views on some of the major threats and opportunities on the horizon. And obviously China is one of them. I also think that US allies and partners sometimes tend to view SMT uh, strategic questions differently. Uh, often in the United States, we sort of couple strategic and economic questions and try to view them together and other allies and partners tend to sort of focus on one track or the other. So having an informal forum to bring these conversations together, I think could be really productive. But to lead effectively, we need to lead with humility and with confidence. We need to listen, not just lecture, and we need to bring allies in early. So I think having those conversations and working through some inevitable disagreements on privacy, on data protection uh, will be really important, but it just goes to underscore how important it is for America to lead with its values at home and to put forward an affirmative agenda on these questions. And I think that will help catalyze a common agenda. On the domestic side, I think we have a whole host of questions on our own approach uh, to grapple with. So that's both the agenda of building up our own talent base, uh, preserving our openness edge, thinking about long-term R&D strategically, thinking about our US-based uh, microelectronics uh, capacity, so there's a whole host of questions there, but then we have to wrestle with policy questions on social media companies, on, on regulations. Uh, and so that's a, that's a whole separate challenge, but it, it implicates our international technology alliance agenda uh, by definition. Uh, and then a final one is just bureaucratic, making sure that we think about how to have greater coordination across the interagency to make sure that the equities are represented, that we have senior leadership who is bought in and, and really up to speed on a lot of these delicate challenges in emerging technology policy. And to make sure that we have a coherent approach across all of our tech toolkit. And I think that's gonna be really important. So across all of these areas, from the diplomatic coordination piece uh, to bureaucratic challenges uh, to our own national policy agenda, I think, I think we have a, a lot to do, but I am, I am hopeful that the incoming administration can find affirmative approaches to this in ways that can align with our, our partners and allies. Great, Melissa, your turn. Um, I, I really wanna build on what Andrew said. I think that um, we really do have to think about our domestic engagement in foreign policy and national security. We've really bifurcated national security as being something we do external to the United States historically. Um, I think we, we need to really reconsider almost domestic alliances with the private sector, uh, with states and local governments. We've really seen this in the pandemic response. 
that those networks and the, the sort of ability to very effectively engage the American capability that we have um, and to, to really engage on our value-based approaches to security and to really understand that national security means we are securing our national values. Um, I think that connectivity with the domestic landscape is so critical. And I think when it comes to research security, it's even more interesting in that most of the folks <clears throat> historically in the federal government who focused on technology have been raised as program managers. So they focused on funding, they focused on managing dollars. And so this idea that we now are not the primary source of all of that money uh, means that we need new skills. We need to be able to build these networks with our private sector. Um, and I think there's a very interesting opportunity here. If I were the new administration, I would, just like I have an international affairs group in the Office of Science and Technology Policy, I would have a lead, a director for domestic te technical alliances. And their job would be to really understand the 75% of American R&D that is not federally funded. Um, and I would have a National Security Council role for actual domestic alliances and really begin to build these networks. This public-private partnership that we talk about for research security, in my mind, is really a very concrete, specific implementation of this larger idea that we really have to re-engage it very, very aggressively with our own domestic landscape if we want to be able to really take full advantage of that and to effectively project out and develop really strong international alliances as well. Great answer, thank you. Remco, can you tell us about the obstacles to, I guess, you know, in your case, as you said, your recommendation was don't cancel OPT. Seems like the Biden administration is unlikely to cancel OPT. So let's go with your stretch recommendation of having it enshrined in legislation. Absolutely. Um, no, I think immigration, there are gonna be no obstacles. It's easy. Um, no, I think, uh, you know, to be serious, the uh, the real challenge, I think, for, for a lot of immigration reform uh, in general is when things have to happen through legislation, it's hard to do them even when there's consensus on a specific problem, right? Because immigration legislation proposals tend to kind of expand, even if it starts off narrow, you know, people have their own preferences and things that need to be fixed about the immigration system. And so even narrow immigration bills tend to turn into comprehensive immigration reform. And so even when there's consensus on kind of narrow issues, such as the importance of OPT, uh, things tend to, you know, not be, not be solved because uh, it's, a, it's a legislative challenge to keep that separate. Um, and I think in, in other uh, you know, immigration areas beyond OPT specifically, there are things that can be done through executive action. I think a lot of the first year is gonna be spent on kind of reversing stuff that has happened in the last four years. Uh, it's gonna be really challenging to, to use executive action for you know, big positive changes, um, both legally and just due to resource constraints. Um, so I think that's you know, another, another consideration. And then just third and finally, I think OPT is is important, but it's sort of a, the immigration system right now is a is kind of a funnel, right? You can have you know two hundred seventy thousand people enter OPT. The program isn't cap, uh, but there is a cap on the number of H one Bs per year, and there is a cap on the number of green cards that can be issued per year. And from the perspective of actually retaining international talent in the long term, it's really the bottleneck at the kind of you know further end of the funnel, um, especially the number of green cards that are available each year, which is very limited. Um, I think that that is ultimately the key bottleneck. And so I think that is, you know, going to be a challenge from an immigration perspective uh, and with everything else going on in Congress and to the general political struggles around immigration. I think it's going to be challenging. Perhaps I'm slightly less hopeful than Andrew and Melissa on my topic than they are on theirs. But um, yeah, maybe there, maybe there will be something that happens in the next two years. But with everything else going on, we'll have to wait and see. Indeed, much to wait and see on, I think. Um, great, the first audience question I wanna take, I think I'll lob it first to you, Andrew, but others feel free to jump in if you would like to. This is about um, just a, a good scene setting question, I think, from a competitiveness point of view, where are we today, We, uh, meaning the US, um, in AI compared to China and Russia, for example, and also compared to, to other technology leaders in the world. Andrew, I know you wrote a whole paper on US advantages and disadvantages um, in AI. So can you just give us a little bit of the lay of the land of where the US stands at present? Great, I mean, I, so I would sort of think of this in terms of three core 
areas. The first are what are, what are the core capabilities in AI? So that would include data, that would include computing power, uh, algorithmic efficiency, and I think talent really underpins that. And so after the capabilities, what are the core enablers? And I'd point to commercial investment, uh, to R&D, and to sort of our workforce. And then what are the ecosystems that sustain that? And so there you have to look at our innovation, our S&T innovation ecosystems, a lot of the work that Melissa's done, our education system, our, our openness edge, our immigration system, our network of alliances. Uh, and there, I just, you know, I, I tick through each one. You know, I think it really depends on the context, depends on the scope and domain of the question that you're wrestling with and the kinds of partners that you're working with and what objectives that you seek in the world. Uh, but if I go through each one, I do think America has a strong hand to play on AI. I think traditionally, you know, our, nurturing that openness edge has been really vital for us as Remco's research has shown. Uh, we've been a leader on many of the developments uh, in, in algorithms over the last couple of years and in software frameworks. I think data is a, is a complicated story uh, and it really depends on sort of levels of experimentation and the context in which you're working because AI is so context specific. But our, our global platform and sensor networks produce a lot of data. Uh, and I do think that we have very capable science funding agencies across the board. Uh, and as Melissa's research has shown, we have a much more diverse uh, R&D ecosystem. So while that, a lot of that is not coming from the government these days, we do have a dynamic system. And if we learn how to network and optimize all the actors in the system with the right policies, the right human capital, and the right infrastructure, I think we can do a lot on that front. And of course, on the alliances side, I think we do have a very big significant advantage with our allies and partners. The question is, how do we leverage that broad uh, network of allies and partners uh, to meet important ends and to shape the technology in ways that are conducive to democratic values. So on all three of those areas, I think America sustains strong advantages. Uh, and the question for policymakers is, what are the right tools and approaches and how can we unify them in sort of a coherent approach, whether that's on microelectronics, whether that's on R&D for the long term and in an inter interdisciplinary fashion, whether that's on human capital networks, or whether that's on projects with allies that can really leverage the democratic world. And so I, you know, I think that there's a whole area where we can uh, pursue sort of forward-looking policies, but it's a choice. You know, it doesn't happen automatically and nothing's guaranteed. And we're in a very contested, difficult environment at home and abroad. So it's really going to require, I think, a lot of strategic foresight uh, to understand where the opportunities are and how to seize them. It's not just a world of threats, it's also a world of opportunities. And so I think with the incoming administration, we have a chance to really try to seize on that. That's great. Um, the next question I wanted to jump to, it does a really nice job actually of pulling together all three of your topics. So well done to, uh, to the questioner here. Um, and this is about how would we, so either the US specifically or a tech alliance encourage Chinese AI students, um, AI researchers to support the advance of AI in the United States, given the, you know, various avenues in Chinese law that require them to report on things they've learned, um, report on things they've done. And in general, I guess, you know, given the, the overall competitive environment between the US and China, um, what sort of protections um, could or should be offered? What other strategies could be used? I may, I'll maybe start with Remco on this because I know that um, relates very directly to, um, you know, the cost benefit of having students in the US. Melissa, I'm sure you'll have thoughts. Andrew, feel free to jump in if you, if you have an alliance angle you'd like to bring, uh, but Remco, go for it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think this is a hugely important question. One of the, I think, salient background facts is that despite the immigration uh, difficulties that we were talking about before, uh, the data that we have on how many Chinese students stay in the United States after graduating from US programs shows that the vast majority stay, um, at least historically have, uh, have been, the data is always a couple years behind. But uh, for PhDs, for example, we know that we, we've you know, at CSET collected a uh, data set ourselves of several thousand graduate students uh, who, who finished AI programs in recent years, and we can track them up to five years. And at that point, 90% of Chinese PhD students are still in the United States working for US companies or US universities. And so I think that's just something to, to keep in mind um, in this debate, but it's not the full question, right? Because as the questioner suggested, there are laws in China that, uh, you know, at least suggest that they could sort of put pressure on people, even if they stay in the United States to, to hand over sensitive information. Um, I think risk assessment in this case really requires kind of case by case 
uh, analysis and you can't just make across the board statements about, about um, the risks here. For example, people who work in universities mostly work with open data. And so the data that the Chinese government might access there um, you know, is a lot less sensitive than in certain uh, areas in the private sector, for example. Um, and I think really a question here is, you know, there's some cost to um, having Chinese students not come. Uh, there's some cost to uh, having Chinese students come and then leave. And then there's some cost to having Chinese students come and then stay. Uh, and we just need to be, I think, very sort of non-ideological and empirical about comparing those. And I think generally this conversation is just too kind of extreme about, you know, we don't want any of them, we want everyone to stay. Um, and and I think we need to just have a have a sort of more mature conversation than we have been having on this. Um, so that's just, I think, kind of a big picture, a big picture background. So yeah, perfect, to... big, pack, big picture to set up for Melissa, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how do we kind of, how should we handle this risk management piece, especially given, you know, all that you're saying about the existing structures based around, you know, federally funded research and reporting there. Um, what would a better approach look like? How do we detect risk where it exists while protecting, you know, the many students who come here and, you know, are behaving totally legitimately? Well, I think that one of the things we have to remember is even in the universities, 50% of research is not funded by the government, right? And so if we become too extreme and, and we drive a complete lack of nuance, as I think Rimco mentioned, into this discussion, we will ultimately drive people away from the funding that we want them to take to do cutting edge research um, for the government and specifically for the national security space. So we have to be cognizant that nuance is critical. We also have to be reasonable that there is a genuine threat, that even if a person stays, if their family is in danger, um, we have to be thoughtful and respectful of the fact that the, the threat is real. So believing that we are in um, a sort of historic situation where we had more global dominance and the threat looked different, it's, it's not something we can be nostalgic for. We do have to be realistic and I think strongly realistic about, about the situation we have in front of us. So I feel like we need to develop real risk assessment frameworks that are developed at the organizational level and are developed along the lines of the decision that you are making, right? So if I'm co-authoring with someone and essentially the only advantage that's going to be provided is a three month lead and knowing something I'm going to make completely public um, in a journal a bit later, the risk is probably lower. If I'm hiring someone in who's gonna have full access to my networks um, and full access to my tacit knowledge, my uh, bar may be higher for their background. I think we need to be aggressive about making these types of risk assessment frameworks available. We need to train people that this is no longer a discussion of total openness or total fear, um, that there is actually a very real middle ground that we need to think about. And I think going back to some of what Andrew was saying in the last question, we also, it behooves us to realize that we need to make choices. And those choices should be driven by who we want to be and the country we want to secure and the values we want to promote um, rather than metrics on being better or more quantitatively productive than another country. I feel like sometimes we drive ourselves into negative behaviors trying to win a quantitative measurement race rather than are we actually gaining an advantage that helps us secure the nation we want to be. And I think our leadership owe this country a positive vision of the America that national security is here to affect and risk assessment frameworks at every level that help people understand the choices they are making inside that system. I would make very different choices about a postdoc that I would hire to go onto a military base and work in a lab than a postdoc I would hire as a military organization to be at a university or a postdoc that I would hire to only have um, maybe like a part-time role doing collaborative work where they never engage my staff at all. These are three fundamentally different decisions, but right now we sort of treat them as the same choice. And so I think I also really just wanna put a pitch for immigration is not about China. There is, there is also a way to begin to shape immigration that helps us welcome in 
immigrants that maybe feel more sort of culturally aligned to the norms and the technology development and the projects we want to uh, progress as a nation. And I think there's some conversations that are uncomfortable and hard and not traditional that maybe need to be had as we begin to think about this more holistically and not as a binary race with China. And by the way, there's a question in here asking if we're starting a Cold War. We start a Cold War if we decide it's a Cold War, right? The more our language elicits this, the more our decisions lack nuance and drive us in that direction, the more our research focuses on it, and then suddenly we find ourselves in a Cold War, right? I just want to very briefly double down on, on one thing Melissa said, which is sort of the separation between immigration and China. And I think in addition to what Melissa was saying, which I agree with, um, one thing there is, you know, is are immigration tools the way to deal with this risk? And I think it's sort of, as Melissa said, you know, very context specific what the risk is. But when you're a consular officer and you're, you know, evaluating someone's student application, um, you're not in a position to assess that risk. And so that's probably not the part of the system where we can most efficiently address those risks. They probably come at some other point. So I think that's another way in which just those two conversations are probably best had separately. Yeah, makes total sense. Next up, I turn uh, back to you, Andrew, um, with a question, I guess, maybe combining a few different questions about kind of AI and democratic values, but especially one about um, the fact that we have, you know, China obviously has a strong AI, AI system, many AI companies, um, and some of those companies uh, are being used by, you know, the, the Chinese government to control the population, to engage in surveillance practices that are not really in line with US values. Um, what role do you think the US should have on exports or sanctions or other measures to ensure that AI is not used to suppress democracy or human rights? How do allies come into that? What are the kind of structures and, and paradigms we should be thinking about here? Thanks for the question. I mean, I would say that on just to, to tie into what uh, Melissa and Remco were saying before, that there's an allied dimension to these questions around research integrity and tech protection. Uh, and in many cases, when we're, we're making these risk-based assessments, I think it, it behooves us to talk these uh, questions through uh, with allies and partners who have a real expertise on s and monitoring uh, and who have uh, investment screening procedures and their own visa screening procedures uh, and more coordination there. It's already happening. Uh, we have experts across the government who are doing this uh, and there's ways to advance it and deepen it further. Uh, and so I think that conversation is, is really important. Uh, in terms of the, the questions around what, you know, what can we do on these surveillance technologies? I mean, I think we have uh, a number of people at CSED who have done terrific research on this. I do think there's a leading role for the State Department and other agencies to articulate uh, standards to, you know, to advance a rule setting initiative across the board, uh, whether that's through the Global Partnership on AI or the ISO or building on the OECD AI principles. I think America is good at this. We, sh we should trust our diplomats and we should put our best foot forward uh, to have an assertive across a lot of standard setting conversations. We should be coordinating that with a strategic communications plan to raise public awareness. We should be thinking about risk-based compliance frameworks for our companies uh, so that they're not contributing hardware solutions uh, to, to uh, human rights abuses of surveillance technologies. And we could be thinking much more creatively about how to develop holistic strategies to deter and respond to these human rights abuses of surveillance technologies and working through track 1.5 and track two dialogues uh, with civil society, with industry, with research institutions uh, to think about how to mitigate these risks, how to spot them, what are early indications and warnings, and then also how to catalyze investments in counter surveillance technologies uh, to think through how to mitigate bias and facial recognition. Uh, and also to work with partners uh, in global swing states in places where we could be doing more on digital capacity building that puts an alternative model forward. I mean, I think a big part of the conversation that we're having today is how can democracies offer a compelling and clear alternative? And some of that means making smart investments, working with the Development Finance Corporation, USAID, state and other agencies, and then with private sector actors to put forward a model that has, that has privacy at the core, that, that leverages uh, digital rights funds to support local journalists, uh, to think through how we can support uh, civic uh, tech initiatives in different countries. So I think there's really opportunities there and it just requires a smart, effective, a coordinated approach 
across the government, but very much so in coordination with all these other actors outside of government, which in the AI space have a very important role to play uh, in strategic development and implementation. Thank you. Melissa Remco, did you want to add anything to that? Nope. Great. Then I'll jump to the next one, which is for anyone who would like to take it. Um, what do you believe was the most effective action or decision taken by the Trump administration uh, to improve US S&T competitiveness? So, you know, obviously we're about to transition to a new way of looking things, a new, looking at things, a new set of priorities. But if anyone has standouts for them of, of actions or decisions from the Trump administration, I'd love to hear them. I mean, I'll jump in here. I think, um, you, you know, I think we have an uncomfortable relationship with industry in the United States in general. There's sort of this feeling that the, there's this solely profit driven perspective and then there's like good stuff that's funded by the government. And that's really comes from this historical relationship where the federal government was really almost 70% of, of research funding. Um, but I think they really did take industry seriously and they took transition of technology into a more applied space seriously. And I think that we saw again during the pandemic, a real breakdown between the sort of global leader in science, not really being able to rapidly affect sort of getting over that valley of death into application as quickly as we would have assumed um, as a nation that we might have. And so I do think this pivot to thinking more seriously about transition and applied research and realizing that you can't simply fund basic science and then just hope that it will turn into things that you do actually have to tend this space and you have to take it seriously and you have to create places for people to talk about it. You have to create networks to, um, to focus on it and you have to fund it. Uh, and so I do think that this is a, this is a focus. This was, a, this was recognized more effectively in this administration than in the past. And I hope and I feel like when we look at some of the legislation like the Endless Frontier Act and others where you see a continued focus on transition and really bringing things into local economies and into the workforce that I'm, I'm hoping that this is a sustained shift in perspective. Thank you. Andrew or Remco, any highlights you'd like to add? I just briefly build on one thing that Melissa said, just to draw what I think is a really important point. That you know, R and D investments uh, from basic through applied and AI are really important. And I think even more important are R and D investments for the long term across the board in an interdisciplinary approach, because I think a lot of the a lot of the dynamism in our system uh, comes from these long term patient uh, investments over time. Uh, and then leverage our research institutions, our industries, our state and local players. And so I do think it has to be a holistic interdisciplinary approach across the board, not just in one technology. And if you look back at the history uh, of our sort of advances on the technological front, a lot of them have come from adjacent areas and from places where they only bear fruit uh, many years later. And so I, I do think this combination of investing in, in basic science also with an eye toward applied work is really important. We've got to do it across the board. So I just wanted to emphasize that point. Yeah, that's a great point. I've been reading recently about some of the enabling advances in the, the COVID vaccines, you know, the mRNA vaccines and all of the different building blocks that had to be in place for us to be able to create that vaccine so, so quickly this year and how um, the range of areas they came from and the often sort of unexcited responses they got at the time because they were not seen as really being that important um, but having that all, you need to have all those pieces together. Um, Remco, were you going to jump in with one as well? Yeah, I mean, I think one one thing actually going back to an answer Andrew gave um, to a, a couple of questions ago. Uh, one thing I think that happened, you know, somewhat quietly uh, in the background, as I think been good multilateral engagement on some of the sort of tech transfer uh, things, including kind of how we deal with sort of some of these security risks, uh, you know, in terms of visa policy and 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 like talent flows in general. Um, and I think that's something that the Biden administration can can continue and hopefully ramp up a little bit. Uh, one thing or one reason that that is important is I think, you know, the U.S. just because of the way that, you know, as Melissa said, uh, you know, there's sort of globalized R&D and, and, and like access uh, to technologies everywhere is even if the U.S. manages, for example, to screen out all risky people 
uh, from domestic universities and domestic companies if they access the same technology somewhere else in the world where you know screening systems are less good for example you haven't actually solved the problem you might have just weakened you know american universities and companies but you didn't actually achieve what you wanted to achieve so i think that's one that's one thing that i think the trump administration you know when it's been sort of in the background and quiet has been has been pretty good uh, has been pretty good at and that's something that i hope will continue great Kind of building on this theme as well um, of you know the, the the real dynamics of the transition from Trump you know administration policy to a new Biden administration, um, we have a question about the uh, AI executive order signed under the Trump administration. Um, and again, this is a question for I think any of you who'd like to jump in on it. Do you have um, or do you have recommendations regarding that executive order? Should it be retained? Um, should there be any modifications to scope? Um, interested in anyone's take on on that executive order as part of kind of the Trump's Trump administration's approach to to AI. So I'm an I, I'm by far the old lady in this group. So I mean, and I'm a bureaucrat by trade, if not in the moment. So perhaps this is a an unhelpful answer. But at the end of the day, um, executive orders are there to put forward um, a perspective of that White House, right? So they've, they've set forward a set of ideas that were important in the Trump administration and that they feel should inform um, the nation, the government, and the next administration. I don't really feel like it matters whether you keep an executive order or you overturn an executive order. I think it's very clear that the Biden administration um, take science seriously. I think it's very clear that they have sent messages that they are going to hire talented technical people to lead across the government in a lot of these technical areas. And they've made it very clear that artificial intelligence is something along with several other uh, high tech areas that they think are critical. So in my mind, an executive order is like just about as good as the paper it's written on and how much clout you have to shake it at people. So I think I have full faith that the Biden administration will take the parts of that that are good and um, will leave the parts that they don't feel serve them with the people that they put in place. Is that a good bureaucratic answer? <laughs> Fantastic bureaucratic answer. You win the bureaucrat prize. Um, actually, bouncing back to you with this next. Oh, go ahead, Andrew. Well, I was, I was just going to say there. You know, there there is a there are parts where it talks about promoting trust among the American people, and that's just a topic I wanted to return to on this theme of making sure that our domestic and international policies are synced up and working for for people at home. I think uh, too often some of these conversations uh, don't really involve the American people, and we ought to be thinking about how to increase confidence in these technologies, because that's going to be a critical part of deployment and use and how we can shape them in ways that that support our democratic values. So I think making sure that the public is part of this conversation on the real challenges with these technologies, understanding the limits uh, of some of these AI enabled systems on safety, on security, making sure that we're talking about ethics uh, and cyber protections and questions around jobs uh, and automation. So I think there's a whole range of issues uh, even on the international agenda that do require attending uh, on the home front to make sure that the public is bought in, that there's confidence behind this, because then you can project outward sustainably and with confidence. So I think that's an important part uh, of any strategic approach from the federal level is to think through how we make sure we bring society along too, and how we learn from society in the process and hear what their concerns are. Yep, that's a fantastic answer. Um, switching back, switching gears back to uh, Remco and a question about talent. Um, we have a question asking, foreign talent helps build a diversity of ideas and methodologies when addressing problems. However, we should also be concerned about our domestic talent. Is domestic US talent moving into AI or is it mostly supported by foreign talent? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think actually Melissa has done great research on this as well. Uh, I think we've focused on, you know, both sort of graduate level talent and their uh, immigration and sort of foreign talent looms really large, but then there's also, you know, a lot of talent that's more on kind of the implementation side, people who don't need, you know, PhDs, 
Um, and there, I think we see, you know, very different numbers. So, you know, while two thirds of graduate students in AI related programs at US universities are, are international students at the bachelor's level, uh, I think it's around 90% are domestic. Uh, so that's just a very different picture. And there's a lot more of those students. And obviously implementation is also super important in addition to sort of doing R and D. So, uh, we definitely see, I think actually maybe today or, or, or yesterday, um, uh, Diana, uh, one of our research fellows, also published a paper on the domestic workforce, which everyone should go check out. Um, and that was much more focused on the implementation side. So absolutely, we need both. I think we need immigration reform and we need domestic investments. I will say also linking it back to the previous question, the Trump administration, I think in the executive orders and in a lot of the writing emphasized domestic workforce and domestic education a lot. It didn't always come through in the funding. Um, so, you know, and that's where I think really the rubber meets the road, but I think that is an important priority. Uh, and so, yeah, I think those are not mutually exclusive. And when you look at, you know, even today when we're in a terrible economic crisis and a lot of people can't find work, the unemployment rate in computing education is actually lower now than it was before the pandemic. It's now 2.3% as opposed to 3% before the pandemic. And so I think this isn't, you know, immigrants crowding out, uh, you know, domestic uh, people from jobs there. It's actually, you know, we just need all hands on deck uh, and, uh, and there can be more of both. So um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question. Fantastic. Melissa, did you have anything to add? I just, I want to double down on the fact that I, th I think Diana Gal House work is amazing. And when we look across the jobs that are relevant to actually not only creating AI, but using it, she's created a framework that is inclusive of the core technical talent, the adjacent core technical talent, the program managers, um, the, the product developers. So there's a framework there that is, is, I think, really useful to thinking about not just thinking about AI and making algorithms, but actually making AI work in our society. And when you look across all of those jobs, I mean, the sort of 80% of those jobs require bachelor degrees. And at the bachelor level, about 92% of our students in computer science are, are American. So the, the immigration problem is almost a red herring in some ways when we talk about this from an application standpoint and an economic standpoint. Um, but it is critical when we think about it in terms of where will our next startups come from? Where will the future technology come from? So we have to balance these two things. Yeah, great. The next question is for you as well, Melissa. It's about, um, I, I mean, really continuing to dig into this federal government, not federal government um, question. Should the federal government be dictating research security or risk requirements, or is there a non-regulatory or legislative way of handling this? So, I mean, I don't think we're ever going to get around the government wanting to have regulatory punitive approaches for things they fund. This is just sort of how bureaucracies roll. So, uh, I won't spend a lot of time talking about the obsession we have with the 25%, but for the 75%, I think there are absolutely non-regulatory, non-legislative approaches. And if that is actually, I think, core to the paper that Zach and I published um, yesterday or today, very recently this week, which we're both very excited about. And it really focuses on this idea of creating a partnership that brings education, data, risk frameworks and is really more sort of inspired almost like by the cybersecurity community or the consumer uh, board, right? Where the federal government is there to be helpful. They're a player. They link back when we do have questions of legality or concern, but really it's a self-regulating mechanism that allows people to lean into getting more educated and taking more responsibility for that upfront. It may not be the complete answer to the question, but the FBI's authority really only extends so far. And we can spend all of our time trying to further extend a punitive structure, or we can spend some of our time leaning in, helping make all of these American researchers, all of these companies, really embrace the idea that we're part of this American capability that gives us economic and national security. And we could be helping them have a sort of well-identified role and take some personal responsibility. And I think it goes a long way to start there, even if that's not um, the not 100% answer at the end of the day. Great, thank you. Um, 
I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions that we can squeeze in. The next one I'll go for is about um, how should the next administration address the cross-cutting nature of tech policy without only prioritizing security? So obviously technology is very relevant to US national security. It's also very relevant to our economic interests and to other interests. So would love to hear from, from anyone who'd like to chime in on this. I will say that I personally am interested both in the sort of from a big picture strategic perspective, there's obviously lots of cross-cutting elements to technology, but also from a bureaucratic perspective and from a you know governmental design perspective, um, a new, an incoming administration has lots of flexibility in terms of how they structure what kinds of offices exist, who, which responsibilities fall where. Um, so I would love, love to hear your thoughts on that aspect as well. Who'd like to kick us off? Andrew, go for it. Yeah, I just, I, you know, I thought this is an opportunity to couple this uh, good question with another one about priorities. You know, administration has to reconcile ends, ways, and means, and resources, uh, and it has to figure out priorities. Uh, and so one thing, we, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about two or three affirmative uh, priorities that we could be pursuing uh, in a way that gets at the question of sort of how do we think about priorities beyond just security. Uh, and I just want to talk briefly about standards, uh, R&D, and, and biosafety initiatives. So let me just quickly on standards. I think one question for us is this is an opportunity, as I said earlier, for, for American leadership. Uh, it's something that our allies care deeply about. And so we have to think through what are the objectives of our standard setting? Uh, what kind of standards uh, do we really want to focus on, on security, on ethics, on privacy, on interoperability? Who are all the key actors and, and how do we map that space? And then what are our resources? How do we make sure that we are properly resourced at home to engage credibly on standards uh, in the international arena? So that means we need, we need models, pressure tested data. We need the right amount of full-time equivalent employees at these agencies. We need to make sure that there's coordination across the interagency, but also with industry players who play a really important role in this, as well as research labs. Uh, and then we need to think about how to articulate sort of some of these affirmative uh, standards that are really going to matter for next generation uh, technology. So one thing that ties into the R&D program that I want to talk about is that a chance to work with our allies on R&D for AI systems that go sort of beyond the data hungry, data powered AI systems thinking about small data approaches, thinking about robustness, right? How do we make sure that our models are robust to adversarial examples, uh, to model inversion? Uh, this is an opportunity perhaps for a grand challenge. And similarly on privacy enhancing technologies, this is a chance for cooperative R&D projects in an affirmative way with our allies on, a, on an issue they care about, which is privacy. And that's how we lead with our values. And the same with biosafety, you know, in addition to the biosecurity agenda, which is really important, uh, there's also a whole uh, host of opportunities with allies to think through how do we measure biosafety? How do we do biosafety training and standardize that? How do we think about screening DNA synthesizers? So there's a whole range of opportunities that we can couple with the tech protection agenda that I think offers us a, a firm foot forward with our allies and partners in the world. I want to jump in and take like a totally different sort of tack on it because I totally agree with everything Andrew said. Um, but I also feel like just because we talk a lot about security doesn't mean that's all we did. The largest R&D funder in the American government is the National Institutes of Health. It's not the DOD, right? So first of all, it's not all we do. The National Science Foundation is still funding incredible work on you know, the environment, incredible work on math and physics. NOAA and NASA are funding explorations of our oceans and space. We are funding and working in a tremendous array. So because we talk about it, people tend to think that's all we do. But the American R&D ecosystem is well over $500 billion of richness. And there are some amazingly diverse projects out there, companies, academic work, et cetera. I would also layer on top of that, perhaps one of the things that we can think about again is that this all doesn't have to be driven by what the federal government funds. So maybe someone in OSTP could actually map out what are, Brookings Institute actually did a great study on what is a critical mass of an innovation center, right? And you can map out the, the sort of institutions, industry, talent flows, funding, et cetera, that you have in different places around different sectors, whether it's healthcare, transportation, space, um, national security. 
but actually national security would probably be pretty far down on the list of where you're going to start when you start to look at what the American nation actually has when you look at these innovation hubs. And so I would suggest maybe one of the really interesting things we could start to lift up is let's map our American capability that isn't federal. Let's use the federal government to fill those gaps and to drive spaces that maybe don't necessarily get driven endemically or sort of in those in those local places. But let's also call attention to those and maybe do matching funding where we want to lift that up or create sister cities where we want to try to transfer some of that capability. There's so much opportunity for creativity here. Um, so let's just let's just kind of open our minds to the fact that just because one guy's talking about it all the time on the TV doesn't really mean that's all we do. Come on, Melissa, you're also talking for the Center for Security and Emerging Technology. So really security should be the be all and end all. But economic security is national security. So it is the end all and be all. <laughs> I'm with you. Remco, do you have anything to add or shall, shall we round it out? Yeah, there were a number of other really excellent questions that I wish we'd had time to get to. Unfortunately, um, we are a little over 5 p.m. I will say I thank Andrew, Melissa, Remco very much for joining us today. And I will also say that you know their contributions here are just a sampling of what CSET has to offer. So I believe in the invitation for this event, there was a link to um, all five of the, the one pagers that we put together for the Biden administration. And also on our website, you'll find you know, a whole suite of other research, including you know, full length, much more in-depth papers by all three of our panelists on exactly these topics. All right, I think with that, I will hand the reins back over to Lynn. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us. This was a lot of fun. Thank you, Helen, and I echo your thanks to all of our panelists and folks. Yes, many of the items referred to in today's uh, discussion are on the research page of our website. We'll also place the relevant links in a follow-up email to those who had registered for the webinar because we have your email addresses. And mark your calendars for our next event on February 11th when CSET Distinguished Fellow Dr. Reginald Brothers will discuss the very timely topic, Modeling a Secure Future, Advanced Methods for Managing Risk, and Improving Resilience. In the meantime, we deeply appreciate your joining us today. Stay safe, and uh, we hope to see you soon, if only virtually. Thank you for coming. Bye-bye.